a new month begins. And what better way to usher it in than with another look at Robert Cushman Murphy's Logbook for Grace, an account of the 1912 whaling voyage of the brig Daisy. Here is Murphy's entry for November 2nd. November 2nd, latitude 30 degrees 54 minutes south. Today, a haze has obscured the horizon, and the old man failed to get a good morning sight for longitude. He is not content with yesterday's longitude either, and I suspect that the parallel of this noon is a position of dead reckoning rather than a satisfactorily figured fix. So, all day he has been muttering about making a stellar shot this evening in the brief period of twilight during which both horizon and navigational stars may be clearly discernible. Now, in the Navy or in a modern merchant steamer, shooting the stars at dusk or dawn is commonplace, taken in one stride. Not so on the daisy. Here it seems to be a rare and last resort, a bold and esoteric rite. The old man has been preparing himself as for a great ordeal, poring over Bowditch, the nautical ephemeris, and a star chart. He seems to want the awesome rumor to get around the brig. The old man's going to try for a stellar. What Murphy means by all this talk of shooting the stars and trying for a stellar is that Daisy's captain is going to observe the height of certain celestial bodies relative to the horizon in an attempt to determine the ship's position. In order to accomplish this, he will most likely make use of a device called a sextant. Here is Providence's own example. I will leave it to Dean King to define the object further in his excellent A Sea of Words. Sextant, a handheld optical instrument invented in 1757 by Captain, later Admiral, John Campbell, and used in navigation for measuring horizontal and vertical angular distances between objects, especially for observing the angle of celestial objects above the horizon in determining longitude and latitude at sea. The ultimate refinement of the quadrant, a sextant, so-called because its calibrated arc, or limb, is one-sixth of a circle, is highly accurate. The sextant is indeed a fantastic refinement over other navigational devices. It has a greater angular range than the earlier octant, and has several notable advances over much earlier devices, such as the cross staff not the least of which is the system of shaded lenses and mirrors that save a would-be navigator the discomfort of having to stare directly into the sun while taking observations. On board naval vessels, navigation is generally the responsibility of the sailing master, a warrant officer specially trained in taking observations and in plotting a course on a chart. The captain and his lieutenants are also expected to be proficient in this art, and young midshipmen are generally instructed in navigation, as part of their education and training. In the merchant service, a sailing master is generally not employed, and so the responsibility for navigation falls to the captain and his officers. Here is Richard Henry Dana Jr. to explain the system in The Seaman's Friend. Please note that in this particular context, master is synonymous with captain. Every day, a few minutes before noon, if there is any prospect of being able to get the sun, the master comes upon the deck with his quadrant or sextant, and the chief mate also usually takes his. The second mate does not, except upon a Sunday, or when there is no work going forward. As soon as the sun crosses the meridian, eight bells are struck, and a new sea day begins. The reckoning is then corrected by the observation under the master's superintendence. The master also takes the lunar observations, usually with the assistance of both his officers, in which case the master takes the angle of the moon with the star or sun, the chief mate takes the altitude of the sun or star, and the second mate the altitude of the moon. It pays to be in good practice when it comes to celestial navigation. In the year 1789, the crew of His Majesty's ship Bounty mutinied against their captain, William Bly. Bly was forced into a small open boat with 19 loyal men and set adrift in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. To say that the odds were stacked against this wretched company would be an understatement. But just before the boat was cast adrift, the mutiny's ringleader, Fletcher Christian, handed Bly down his own sextant, saying, There, Captain Bly, this is sufficient for every purpose, and you know the sextant to be a good one. Armed only with the sextant and a pocket watch, Bly successfully navigated the boat over three and a half thousand nautical miles of open water, finally reaching a Dutch settlement on the island of Timor. 
Bly lost not a man during that voyage, although several did become ill in the boat and succumbed shortly after making landfall. William Bly's leadership abilities have long been called into question, but armed with the proper tools, none can doubt his prowess as a navigator.